Each Saturday at this time, the National Broadcasting Company presents Morgan Beatty's War Telescope, a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. Morgan Beatty is NBC's veteran war reporter in the British capital. And so for his regular Saturday report, we take you now to London. This is Morgan Beatty looking at the 203rd week of war through the war telescope. This was the week the Battle of Europe began, the military battle and the political struggle. Let's take each in turn. First, the military. The critical fight of the week, in all due respect to the efforts of our own forces in Sicily and in the air all over Europe, the most important development was the Russian offensive in the center of the long battle line. A glance at any map will reveal the strategic temptation in the center of the Russian line in between the two key cities of Orel and Bielgorod. There lies about 200 miles of railway line, at this moment the most coveted strip of railroad in the world. By holding that strip, with Kursk at its center, the Russians have prevented the Germans from working out a successful offensive plan of operations for this summer. There were, of course, many contributory complications for the Germans. Our mastery of the air in the south of Europe and across the Channel, the attack on Sicily and so on. But the Germans needed that link in the railway system. With that in their hands, they'd have good communications up and down the line between Leningrad in the south, except for a few minor zones. On the other hand, the possession of the orel bielgorod stretch by the Russians has given them adequate north and south communications on the long enough front to make an offensive worthwhile in that area. And communication on any front in modern war is most important, and especially important on the Russian land front, where ordinary highways do not afford rapid supply. Military experts, the Germans attack first. Why not the Russians? Some military experts in Stockholm go so far as to suspect the Germans lost their big drive in the center of the Russian line, in an effort to impress the Soviet army with new driving power and in that way pave the way for an attractive deal with Stalin. Now, there's no longer any doubt but what the basic German strategy now is to separate the Allies. But even so, the Stockholm correspondent who gives that interpretation explains by saying it is difficult un to understand the German mind in situations like the present. And indeed, it is. In any event, the most likely explanation of events of the last two weeks in Russia is that the Germans expected the Soviet army to launch a major offensive in the center in preparation for an all-out offensive this winter. The Germans merely struck first in the hope of dulling the Russian offensive thrust. And they may have taken some of the sting out of it. But what they gained in that direction, they've lost in prestige. But we'll refer to that loss of prestige later on. In Sicily, astounding events have taken place, as you know, even more startling than the sudden collapse of Axis military resistance in North Africa. It could be argued that the Germans and Italians are biding their time in the hills, that they're laying back in ambush, as it were, in the center of the island to strike back when the time comes. And no doubt, they will muster a counterstroke with all the strength they've got. But the truly impressive element of the Sicilian campaign is that the enemy failed to strike at the best moment, the moment of landing. And as it is now, Allied armies can be landed successfully and in his great strength, as the high command desires, thanks to Anglo-American supremacy in air power and sea forces. That is, unless the Luftwaffe wants to concentrate enough air power over the Mediterranean to challenge Allied supremacy, or unless the Italian fleet wants to come out to challenge the Royal Navy's control over the Straits of Messina, the water gap between Italy proper and Sicily. It's not too late for an Axis challenge, but it is late. And therein lies another damaging blow to Axis prestige, another telltale sign. We'll get back to that sign, too, a little later on. Meanwhile, in Western Europe, the United States Army Air Force and the RAF have continued attacks on targets in Europe, ranging all the way from the English Channel southeastward to northern Italy. A new tactical unit of air power has been added to the Allied forces operating from England. American medium bombers yesterday hit the freight yards at Abbeville in France. Spitfires and American Thunderbolts protected them, and none of the bombers was lost. Losses, in fact, in the RAF Bomber Command and in the American 8th Air Force have been much lower in recent attacks than they have in the past. That also is a sign of the times, a potential forecast of the future, a blow to Axis prestige. About that prestige, the Axis powers have made much of prestige in the past, They've made much of the initiative, the offensive, the invincibility of Axis troops and German military genius. Hitler, at one point, has gone so far as to refer to the military idiots, as he called our generals, ranged against the Axis. 
This was bombast intended primarily for Axis ears and for the timid in Allied countries. But it is true that the initiative, the offensive in warfare, is in itself a great weapon, a tremendous advantage, for the fellow on the defensive must always promise the day when he'll turn on the enemy with revitalized strength and smash him. And it's significant that Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin all have used this promise repeatedly in the past. All of them have confessed frankly that the enemy has had the advantage, but that once Allied strength had been marshaled and geared into one gigantic engine of war, the enemy would be smashed. This week, after 202 weeks of war on this side of the world, the Allies have done just that. They have integrated their strategy. They have struck true offensive blows in Europe. Heretofore, every attack on our part has been an attack to push the enemy out of territory he had acquired by force of his own arms, so that even though we were occasionally on the offensive, and brilliantly so, we had not pushed the enemy back into his own backyard. But we're there now, and what do we find in that backyard? Alexander Clifford, writing for the combined British press, gives us partial answers when he tells the story of Allied conquest in a typical Sicilian village. After the Axis troops have been routed, gradually a few cowed people come out of buildings. And the Allied army commander persuades one of them to go fetch the mayor. And the mayor comes. Likely as not, he's a quiet, unshaven little man dressed in a shapeless, ersatz suit. He comes bowing in, flashing his gold teeth in a sickly smile. And he agrees to help if he can. The dead are buried and the water supply turned on after it's examined. Italian prisoners are ordered to clean up the dirty schoolhouse they've been using as a barrack. Soon they're busy toppling things out of upper stories to the courtyard below, such as bug-ridden wooden bedsteads, torn uniforms, packages of cartridges, stacks of fascist propaganda, even portraits of Mussolini. That's Clifford's view on the spot. Now let's turn to Johnny Moroso of the Associated Press, who also talked to Sicilians, including prisoners. One of these was asked by American troops what he thought of Mussolini. His answer was to cut his throat with his finger, as it were, and reply, I would like to cut Mussolini's head off. He sent us here without food, and our clothing is falling to pieces. One group of Italian soldiers, coastal artillerymen, said they wanted to go back to their farms in Italy. They told our troops they knew the Axis would lose the war the minute America and Britain were lined up together. They insisted the Germans had fled before the invasion of Sicily, taking all the food with them, and the Germans had shot Italians in the back for refusing to fight Americans. And the fine quality of American equipment amazed the Italians. Some of these soldiers, incidentally, had packed their suitcases with civilian clothes on the assumption they'd be sent to America. But some American soldiers were inclined, said Moroso, to sniff at Sicilian statements that they liked our troops. These hard-headed American boys point to the snipers who fired when they were detected and then until they were detected and then gave up. The average Sicilian prisoner, says Moroso, has black teeth from lack of care. Few of these men are clean-shaven. All of them appear to have tenth hand the shoestrings, and few show evidence of much bathing. On the other hand, the few captured German prisoners, for the most part, are defiant. They're clean and well-fed. They speak good English, and they say the fight has not yet begun, and when the German army opens up, it will drive the Americans into the sea. All of this information bears out, in general, our report to you of last Saturday, namely that the Italians hate the Germans, that there are signs of military inefficiency in the Italian army if they're given efficient military leadership. And we must remember that the captured Italians now in Allied hands are all remember that the captured Italians now in Allied hands are all Sicilians. There are other Italians yet to be countered from other provinces of Italy. Sicilians have never thoroughly absorbed the Mussolini rule. But all of this adds up to damage to both German and Italian prestige. And the Allied military blows of the past week, the lack of coordination of Axis forces so far in Sicily, the hesitance of the German military strategists in Russia, they're all signs. Here's another one, perhaps a more important sign, and that brings us to the political struggle. Dr. Goebbels, the German propaganda minister, has just turned loose a package of threats against German rumor mongers in his latest article in Das Reich. In times like these, he says, when the government is compelled to be silent, rumor mongers start speaking. His own cowardice, says Goebbels, spurs on the rumor monger. There's no tripe trivial enough. 
He pours forth every nonsensical bit of news, says Dr. Goebbels. Then further on, says, we must act like soldiers, must hear the command and obey. The sign is clear politically, too. German leadership cannot explain away the Allied offensive. The will to action on the part of the democracy. German leadership cannot explain away clearly honest statements like Secretary Stimson's gesture to hear in London. When the war secretary said, and we quote Mr. Stimson, we in America have transformed a peaceful industrial country into a great arsenal in less than three years. We have finished recruiting. We're now engaged in training the best army the United States has ever sent beyond its borders. It's been done with the unanimous support of Congress and the people. It represents the upsurge of power and purpose of a great nation. A power and a purpose that far transcends the differences reflected in the press and among politicians when they differ about small things. That's the American position, clearly, honestly put. Churchill has stated the British position, even though Britain's long battle needs no explaining. The purpose is to smash fascist and Nazi leadership, and that's a determined abiding purpose. The performances of Russian leadership and the Red Army and the Russian people are clear on any map you can buy for a dime. The Nazis will not deny that the line is where it is. They do not deny that they failed to destroy the Russian army. The clear honesty of purpose in every case is entirely too convincing for a propaganda monger like Goebbels. Quite naturally, he's silent, and so is his Führer. And quite naturally, Mussolini is silent. In the face of honest purpose and military offensive action, there is nothing to say. Lies repeated however many times won't save the situation. Now, let's not assume, as some people seem to assume, that our first steps on the offensive represent huge gains. They do not. The greatest gain in the Mediterranean is the coordination of land, sea, and air forces of two nations, Britain and America, under a single commander. That is almost as much of a miracle as the upsurge of power in the United States. As a news analyst, we sometimes wonder if the strong men at the head of the various sections of Allied attack, and they are strong men, capable, aggressive, successful, we wonder if democratic training hasn't played the major part in their coordinated effort. If their ability to work together is not a purely democratic phenomenon, ingrained in them by historic tradition and early training. In any event, we do have something of a miracle in coordination. Whereas at this moment, the axis has exactly the reverse. And propaganda won't fill the void. It won't answer the questioning minds of the German and Italian people. And just because we are on the offensive, there's no need to blind ourselves to the difficulties, political difficulties and differences in our own camp. Difficult problems do exist. The Russian-Polish difficulty, the double leadership in the French committee, Giraud and de Gaulle. There are great internal problems in all the nations involved. But we are honestly threshing out our problems. They're exposed to all of us in headlines and in radio broadcasts every day. But to borrow from Mr. Stimson, the upsurge of power in our nations is unmistakable. Behind our offensive success, buttressing our advantage, lies honesty of purpose. Not a single one of the big four, Russia, China, Britain, and the United States, not a one had aggressive designs on any other nations before war began, and not a one has any aggressive designs now. No conquest of territories or peoples was or is planned. Nothing could reflect that honesty of purpose better than the Roosevelt-Churchill message to the Italian people. It's extremely difficult that this message once again, it's significant rather, reminds Italians in the world that the sole hope for Italy's survival lies in honorable capitulation. Now this is Morgan Beatty saying so long until next Saturday. You have been listening to War Telescope, a weekly report on the war as seen from London by Morgan Beatty, NBC's veteran war observer in the British capital. Mr. Beatty is presented every Saturday at this same time, so you're all invited to tune in again a week from now. This program has come to you from London and New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.